Hello, hello, welcome, and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. As ever, I am joined by my co-host Joe, and we are both very much looking forward to this show as we have another special interview for you. Today's guest, rather than going through the more traditional youth academy route, began his professional football career at the age of 21, having already managed to pursue a college degree and graduate by that time. His playing days saw him represent clubs all over England throughout the football and national leagues, and even had a spell up in the Scottish Premiership too. He's represented the Super Eagles national side a couple times, and these days he's still very much involved with the beautiful game. He's added a master's degree to his list of achievements as well and swapped the UK for the US, much like myself. Now living in Naples, Florida, the land of golf courses, who knows, we may even see him take up a new sporting career. We welcome Enoch Shawunmi to the United Mates Football Podcast. Enoch, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. How are you guys? Yeah, we're doing well. Really, really thrilled to have you with us. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great to have you with us today, Enoch. And I know Kaitel mentioned that you're in Naples in Florida. Um, however, there's a place, in, well, the Naples in Italy is probably the more famous Naples of the two. And the Naples in Italy is kind of known as the home of modern pizza. Now, <laughs> the reason I reference this is on this podcast, we always have an icebreaker question for our guests. So Enoch, our icebreaker question today is, what is your favorite type of pizza? Uh, favorite kind of pizza is probably the actual Neapolitan pizza, which is like very thin crust. So my wife's actually Italian. So um, I've been schooled in the arts of pizza. And she's actually from the south of Italy. She's uh, from Sicily, but close to Naples um, in the south of Italy. So um, probably like a, a, little, a little mushroom, a little speck and a white pizza. So and a little truffle. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds very nice. Sounds like a great choice. But Kaitel, what about you? What's your favourite pizza? It's not as sort of um, distinguished as as speck and um, truffle. Uh, I'm sure Enoch's wife probably wouldn't wouldn't approve. But I'm that guy who likes pineapple on the pizza. So probably like pineapple and jalapeno. Although if I was back in England, I'd be equally as sort of gross, and I'd go for a tuna and sweet corn pizza. <laughs> but Joe, what about you? What's your favourite? I like many, but maybe. <sighs> I don't know. There's, there's. If I sometimes will make my own pizza, and it will have either pepperoni or bacon on it, some sweet corn, some onions, some olives. It's very random, but you know, it does the job. That that may or may not be a Domino's make your own, so not very <laughs> fancy, but I like it nonetheless. Well, there you go. I guess moving on. The Italians from... will kill you guys. Yeah, <laughs> both of us. Exactly. It's like pretty much blasphemy to put. I would imagine jalapeno and like sweet corn on a pizza, but I don't know, it tastes all right. <laughs> But yeah, let's let's move on to a bit of football. Um, but rather, I guess we'll we'll jump back a little bit. So taking it right back to the start and on the subject of uh, football in your childhood, Enoch. I've heard you say that you were um, sort of started playing football around the age of nine more seriously, and that actually it was quite important in terms of keeping out trouble at the time. Uh, Joe and I actually grew up in West Hampstead, off of West End Lane. So you hear this phrase used quite dramatically sometimes. But so to speak, um, we really did grow up on the other side of the tracks from you over in Kilburn in the sense that we were almost neighbors in terms of proximity but the neighborhood that you lived in could be quite rough so I wanted to know if there was ever a moment when you came close to leading a very different life to that of an academic footballer. Yeah it was like maybe not at nine years old but as I got into the teenage years um, there was obviously a lot of distractions a lot of um, people that I knew in the area um, people I went to school with they were on the other side of the law should I say and um so yeah, so it was it was definitely something that I could have um, been drug into, but um, the football kept me kept me off the streets. It kept me like, just wanting to improve and play. So I, I joined a few like local teams, and it enabled me just to like enjoy the game, keep off the streets, and keep a focus that was different from what some of my friends and 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 school colleagues were doing. Was that drive something that? you found within yourself or did you have any role models at the time that you could look up to to not fall into those bad habits? Um, I think just basically my parents was like I was more scared of my parents than I was of the police so um, <laughs> I think I think it was just like yeah just the influence of, of my parents that um, that really kept me on the straight and narrow and having something to do as well I think that obviously helped a lot. Brilliant well um I think, as Kaitel mentioned at the start, Enoch, you ended up um, 
well, signing your first professional contract, I guess, relatively late on compared to some people who join um, academies at an earlier age and you join Luton initially. So what I was interested to know was, did the reality of being a professional footballer when you finally became one, did it compare to how you sort of imagined it would be before you got that contract? Not at all. So firstly, I was, I was playing for Luton Town on £40 a week for about seven to eight months. So I signed um, off a try of a trial against their uh, a preseason trial game against their first team. I actually played centre midfield as well in that game. I thought I played terrible, but they asked me to come back on trial. After two weeks, I went to the assistant coach and I thought like, I can't afford to keep coming. And he's like, take it or leave it. It's your opportunity. So I was like, damn, it's like that. And so um, after six weeks, they started paying me my expenses. I signed a non-contract where I was actually playing in the first team. I was off, coming off the bench, in and around, travelling up and down the country. Um, made my debut in that September on a non-contract against Plymouth Argyle away. I got um, taken off after 40 minutes because the referee said he was going to send me off. And at that point, I was like, nah, this game's not for me. And then it went on to the point where it was, like, it was February the next year. I'm earning £40 a week uh, for my train fare from London to Luton, which is, I, ironically enough is me jumping on the train from West Hampstead yeah, 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 on the fast train. Yeah, yeah, walking a mile from the station to the ground to go training every single day, and then um, actually signing my contract after scoring a hat trick in a league game in February of that of that of two thousand and four. That February actually got Player of the Month for the division as well on a non contract basis, and but I signed my contract after that hat trick, so it was like that whole process of eight months. I was like wow, this is, this is the professional game. It was, it was nothing like I expected it to be. I just wanted to play football. They converted me into a, into a, into a striker. Never played that position in my whole youth. Um, so I had to just learn the game, learn uh, what the manager kind of wanted from you. And at that time, it's like it, it became a job and not really even a job for me because I, like, I wasn't even getting paid. So like, it just became, like, okay, I need to learn. I need, I need to learn, I need to learn. But this is my dream. And then after a while, when I got used to it, it became like, um, okay, like this is this is something that I, I did dream of doing. Um, I think what helped me is I didn't really know know the lower leagues that much. As a as a kid, I kind of exclusively watched the Premier League, so I didn't know some of the players that was that I was playing against. So it just allowed me to just go out and play like I was playing like the Middlesex County League on a, on a Saturday for Wolves and Constantine before I turned pro. Nice. No, that makes sense. And I guess, yeah, sometimes, yeah, knowing less rather than more can actually help. But no, that's funny to think you'd be mm -hmm. hopping on that train at West Hampstead. And um, obviously, it, it clearly went well at Luton. Um, it was it was all worth it in the end. And you would go on to join um, a club close to my heart, actually, Bristol City from Luton. And then um, there was a season, mm -hmm. the 2006 to the 2007 season, which I'm sure you remember well, when um, Bristol City actually um, achieved promotion and went up to the championship. And that happened to be a pretty good season for you. I think you scored 13 goals in all competitions. So what I want to know is when you look back at that season, um, would it be fair to say that was the most successful season in your career? And is it one of the most enjoyable seasons in, in your career too? Yeah, I think that that season at Bristol City, I kind of um, I left my parents' house. I left the city I grew up in, um, London, so it allowed me just to like grow as a person. Um, allowed me just to focus on just focus on my football, focus on on playing. And, so, and every time I was fit, I was kind of playing. So I think I actually scored fifteen goals that season. No, oh, that's quite yeah. a, a number of assists. Too off you. <laughs> just had to put just had to put that one in there. You know, yeah, you got you got to correct. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a had a number of assists as well, um, and yeah, it was just, it was like an enjoyable it was an enjoyable year. And, um, I think in the city as a whole, I think Bristol Rovers got promoted that year as well. And um, but yeah, it was like I think the manager there at the time he was he was able to push me. I was able to learn a lot about myself, about my game, and um, I played with some some great players as well. So it was it was an enjoyable time to really just really allow my career just to kind of take off. That was kind of my point when I thought, okay, I'm, my, my career is about to take off now. Yeah, no, it certainly did. And I mean, I guess on just sticking on the topic of Bristol City for a second, obviously they're, um, they, they're in the championship and they have been for a few years. Um, they haven't quite made that leap up to the, the Premier League yet. Do you, um, 
I mean, they lost to Millwall last night, 2-0, I think. Do you, do you think now that they've got them, you know, the improved stadium and they've, you know, their finances are good there, can you see them finally making that leap up to the Premier League? Yeah, but I, I think the Championship is probably one of the toughest leagues in the world. It's like, it's, I think it's so difficult to come out of. Um, I think everything just has to go um, your way, kind of with injuries, with just the, the management, the squad, um, the confidence going through. I think when you start the season well, it kind of gives you that kind of, um, it propels you forward. I think that, that season when Bristol City was in, we got to the um, playoff final, right? That, I was, I was that there. That first year yeah. back in the championship. And it's just like, we started the season well and it's like, we just propelled ourselves forward from that point. And as a squad, the confidence was just running through the squad. Um, we, I think we had, some, like, we had some top, top players as well. But um, I think, it's a tough league. The championship is a tough league. I think you have to start well. You have to get momentum going forward. Um, I think if, if, if everything aligns, then Bristol City has the ability to be able to be one of those teams that at least um, hit the playoffs regularly and then at least like um, get that another opportunity to really um, to really get that promotion to the to the Holy Grail. I hope so. <laughs> well. I guess on a on another sort of holy grail being um, international football, we'll move on from uh, from Bristol City, but we'll sort of I guess jump back to your Luton days because that's when you were called up to represent the Nigerian national side, and um, you played in a couple games at the Unity Cup, which took place at Charlton's Valley Stadium. So that was like a mini tournament showcased um, showcasing national teams with large immigrant communities in London. So besides Nigeria, the other sides involved were Jamaica and Ireland. Um, so you and the Super Eagles quite emphatically won that tournament. And so I guess given that your international career, that, that was pretty much the extent of it. it. was It was short, but it was extremely sweet in terms of success. Could you tell us a little bit more about how that all came about and what your experiences of being part of that Nigeria squad were like? It was, it was pretty insane because it, it was a bit surreal when I was called up because I was like, what, they want me? Like, that doesn't make no sense. It was literally my first year as a pro. So I only signed my, my contract in February. And that summer in June, I was like, you're getting called up to the Nigerian national team. So I was like, yeah, they got the wrong guy. It's like, this, this doesn't make no sense. And so when I turned up, I, I didn't even bring shin pads because I was like, I'm not going to play. I'm just, maybe they just want me to train here. Like, I ain't going to actually play. We got like the Carnus, the Cotches, or Femi Martins made his debut at the same time. And I was just like, it was just, it was like literally so surreal that I was actually uh, amongst those type of players. And then like, um, so in the training, it was cool. Um, obviously you meet some of the top guys. Um, I didn't even know you actually get paid to play international football. So there was a big discussion about our payment cut and like going through. And I was like, damn, I didn't even, I thought you just do it for the pride. Like, <laughs> like you just play for your national team for the pride. I didn't know there was money coming through your hands. So I didn't know anything literally about international football. But it's funny, um, when I was 18, just me and my mates in, in London and I was in university at the time, I used to tell them three things. I said, I'm going to play pro football. I'm going to play for Nigeria. And by the time I'm 28, Barcelona is going to put in a bid for me. And so when I got called up to the national team after one year, my mate was just like, damn, man, it's happening. Like all three, all three, all three are coming true. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great time. Um, um, obviously, personally, obviously for my parents as well, they were like, like super proud. And just being in and around the stadium, it was like, it was actually a carnival atmosphere, both against Ireland and Jamaica. So just the, like you say, the fans um, that come in around the stadium, our, our coach coming into the stadium, like the amount of people that just want, did, like, wanted to take pictures. I was like, this is like insane. And I, like most of the fans didn't even know who I was, but it's just like, I was still mobbed by Nigerian fans. And obviously there's a big rivalry with the Jamaicans as well, especially in London. So even growing up, I had a lot of Jamaican friends and Nigerian friends. So like, even those guys were just like, um, again, the bands were just about playing, playing in, that, in that kind of game in London. So... Yeah, it was, it was a great, great experience, but one that I wasn't really expecting. Yeah, you mentioned that you sort of joked around with your mate, or not joked around because it ended up happening, the Nigeria call-up. But given that you had had that in your mind for a while, did that mean that you'd essentially ruled out England? Was there ever a, a moment, because you, you sort of missed out on the youth levels because you weren't in an academy, so you never got to have the mm -hmm. opportunity to play for the England youth teams. But you did you basically always know it was Nigeria or, or bust? No, um, yeah, I don't think my dad would have let me play for England, to be honest. So uh, he like, so I was raised raised in London, but like raised pretty Nigerian. So um, 
yeah, it was, it was one of those things. It was like probably probably my dad's dream more than my own dream. But it was just something I used to say all the time is that I'm going to play for Nigeria. And they used to have great they used to have great kits. They used to love the kits when I was when I was younger. So it was the actual um, the '94 World Cup. They had a great they had a great kit. They won the '96 Olympics. Great games against Brazil and Argentina. So that's kind of what I kind of grew up on 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 watching. Yeah, I remember. I think uh, the 2018 World Cup, uh, Iwobi, sort of representing the the cool kit that they. I, I don't know if it was supposed to be a throwback, but yeah, like you said, the Super Eagles always have the best jerseys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I I agree on the the Nigerian kit front. Always very impressive kits. So it's cool you were able to don one for a couple of international games. But um, going back to your club career again. Um, I know um, you were at Bristol City, like you said, you got promoted and then there was the season where they got to the playoff final um, and nearly got promoted. But I know you ended up going on loan briefly to Sheffield Wednesday and then would actually go on to sign permanently um, for Leeds United, obviously now back in the Premier League. But at the time, I believe we're in the third Mm. tier of English football. So what was it like to play for such an iconic club in Leeds United? But obviously in that third tier and also how did you find moving up north because I guess you'd lived in um you'd lived in Bristol and you would played for Luton but was what was the kind of change of moving up north did you did you settle up there or did you prefer being back in London or more sort of Bristol side no I, I enjoyed my time in Bristol I actually didn't I actually didn't want to leave Bristol it was like it was um the lead actually came in for me in that January um before I went to Sheffield Wednesday on loan and I remember playing a game against Crystal Palace um, away. I think we lost 2-0. And then I get a call on the Wednesday from the club saying, I'm not part of the plans anymore. You should go. So I was like, but I just started on Saturday. Like, what's, um, that's, uh, that doesn't make no sense to me. So Leeds actually wanted to find me then. I think Dennis Wise and Gus Puyat was the management team there. And I said, I, at that point of my career, I was like, no, I only want to stay in the championship. So I said to the I said to the gaffer at Bristol that um, I, I'll leave, but I'm I'm only going to go to a club in the Championship. That's, I want to kind of test myself at that level and see how far how far I can stay at that level. So I ended up going Sheffield Wednesday. Eventually, it was agreed Sheffield Wednesday on loan, and then the second game was against Bristol City. And the, after after at that point, Dennis Wise has actually left Leeds United, and Gary McAllister just became manager. So that res- I, I had an opportunity to actually play the reserve game against Leeds for Sheffield Wednesday or just take the week off. So I just wanted to keep ticking over um, playing football. So I said, I'll play the resi games. I ended up scoring two goals against Leeds in that game. And that's probably one of the reasons why I signed for them in the summer, even under different management. Um, but Leeds is like, Leeds is just a huge, huge club. It's like, like just going into, into the ground at like one o'clock, half one, there's 200, 300 fans wanting autographs and and pictures um you see it's like the only the only club in the city um so like you, you like everyone knows who you are when you when you're when you're playing for Leeds. uh yeah it's just like um it's just even now even even to this day this i didn't play that many games um for Leeds. got a great goal scoring ratio though seven six goals in seven games just just throwing that one out there and um but they um they, they they still remember you. They still remember you. The fan base is just like you're just you just become one of them like in like for as long as you live basically. And it's like um still have so many Leeds United fans reaching out to me. Um they obviously had that um special song that they came up with that I won't repeat on this podcast. Yes. <laughs> but um <laughs> but yeah, so it's a yeah, it's a it's, it's a it's a huge, huge club. The fan base is um very in tune with the club and they really, um, yeah, just, it's just like 25,000, 30,000 every single home game in League One. Um, playoff game, I think it was a full house, 35,000, but almost 38,000 people. So it was like, it's, it was just insane uh, like going, going up there. I enjoyed Leeds as a city. For me, like moving wasn't really, was never really an issue for me. Um, they like to call me, um, I had to change my accent a little bit or just some of my slang because they didn't understand. But, you know, that was, that was, that was the only thing. It's funny you mentioned that that song that, of course, we won't repeat, but Joe and I going to school in London, there was one Leeds fan in our entire school and he introduced the entire year to that song. <laughs> he loved he loved you when you were playing there. Um, <laughs> moving on from from Leeds, literally, I guess, yeah, your next step was up was up to Scotland. 
um, where you joined Falkirk. And this is the top tier of Scottish football. So in your honest opinion, it might, it was a little while back, but what was the standard at the time compared to the levels that you'd played at in England? Um, and then I guess just as a, as a second question there, like that season sadly ended in relegation for, uh, for Falkirk. Um, I don't think they've actually been able to return to the SPFL since then. So what, what went wrong for the team that year? Was it simply a case of a lack of quality on the pitch or were there bigger issues um, yeah, going on behind the scenes at the club? Um, yeah, the standard, the standard of Scottish football, like um, I would say is probably equivalent to, it's probably equivalent to like League One kind of bottom of championship at that time. Now, obviously when you play in Celtic and Rangers, I think I made my debut against Celtic. So like I, I joined Falkirk in January. So I left Leeds and I joined Falkirk. I cancelled my contract with Leeds. I think I just came off, a, I had a blood clot at, at a time on my lungs when I was at Leeds. And that was the, that was this, um, December the previous year. Um, so it was in my first season at Leeds where I got the blood clot and the doctor said I may never play soccer again. Oh, sorry, I say soccer sometimes, excuse, excuse my language. It's a dirty word. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but the doctor said I may never play, I may never play football again. So um, Gary McAllister got sacked and um, Simon Grayson came in as manager. So for the first six months of Simon Grayson being manager, I didn't have the opportunity to prove myself. So he came, brought his own players in. The second season, I was kind of in and amongst on the bench. And I was just going to the club. Listen, I just want to play football. Like I had a, I had a point where the doctors said I may never play again. I am playing again. I just want to play. I just want to enjoy playing the game. And so come January time, I was kind of coming off the bench, playing one or two games. Um, but it wasn't enough for me. So I said, I need to go find and play football. Falkirk were really interested uh, um, in signing me. So I said, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go up to Scotland uh, and play. Um, didn't care where they were in the league. Didn't care about the team. I just wanted to play football. I had to come off of about a year of maybe just starting or playing one 90 minutes in about the last, the year before I actually signed for Falkirk. And then the first game was Celtic away. <laughs> so like... Baptism of fire when I went up to Falkirk. We actually drew one all, so we did we didn't do too bad. But the standard is um, the standard is probably like I said, like League One kind of Championship level. But it's the Scottish Premier League, so it's it's, it's a different ball game. It's like the press conference is different from being in League One or even the Championship. It's like you've got all the reporters in front of you, you're sitting like like they do in the Premier League in England. You're on the back pages of the Scottish Sun, so they did a whole photo shoot of a big like spread when I joined uh, like in the back page of the Scottish Sun so I was like okay this is a little different uh, to what I was used to so like um, but yeah the, the, um, there were some top footballers still playing at the time and I know like um, I played with Scotty Arfield who's, who's done great in England um, played in the Premier League I think he's now uh, playing championship football I think um, no he's back at Rangers sorry he's back at Glasgow Rangers doing well Scotty Arfield um, there's another kid called Ryan Flynn who went down and played with Sheffield United in the championship, did, 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 did great for them. Um, so they, they had like top boys, um, like talented boys still in the Scottish League. I remember playing Rangers and all the, um, all the press was just asking me about Danny Wilson who ended up signing for Liverpool. So I'm not his agent. You don't, <laughs> you don't need to ask me questions about him, like if he's good enough to play in England. So, um, but um, yeah, so he signed for Liverpool, but they, so there's talented boys up in Scotland. Um, overall, the the league is what it is. I remember they when I was there, what I didn't understand, they split the league after 33 games. So it came the top six played against the top six and the bottom. So the, I think the team that came seventh had more points than the team that came sixth. I didn't quite understand that one. <laughs> but um, and then but it, it didn't work out for Falkirk at the time because it's like when you split the league and you're fighting relegation, you want to play against a team, you want your opponents to play against the teams in the top because they're more likely to lose those games. So that last five games, every game is just a pressure game, pressure game, pressure game. And we just didn't um, didn't have the will to really um, win or get enough points that we that we could have. And I didn't score enough goals, but I was playing football nearly every week. So uh, that was my... That was my um, like blessing in disguise, just kind of getting back into the swing of um, putting my body through the trenches every single week. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess speaking of um, playing more regular football, the next the next move from there was uh, to Tranmere. So you, you you've mentioned moving up north and having to change your accent. Then you moved to Scotland, 
And then you move to Merseyside where they have, <laughs> yeah, another great accent. So um, after the campaign you just had previously in Scotland, and you'd mentioned as well the, the blood clot and not really playing consistent football up until that time. Um, this season was a bit more back to normal in the sense that I think you ended up as joint top scorer and player of the season. So, um, yeah, whilst I'm sure it's it's always a good top, feeling to top, be scoring top goals. Scorer. Top scorer, I'm sure. Not, yeah, Not three, top scorer. Just clarification, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nah, fair enough. Um, but so you're, you're top scorer. Um, so that must feel good. But beyond just that feeling of, that good feeling whenever you're scoring goals. Was this sweeter? Was there an element of like relief to your emotions at the time, considering that um, goals were harder to come by? You mentioned at Falkirk and then also this was sort of like the first fruitful spell you'd had in a while, given um, your blood clot as well. No, I think, I think um, Falkirk was just what I needed. I just needed to play football, um, whatever that was. Um, okay, I didn't score the goals, but it gave me the confidence again, just in mentally in my body, um, playing every week. I, I remember like, th- like obviously fans will never know, but there was a point where I actually couldn't move my neck um, to the side. So I was like literally stiff and I couldn't do, I, I literally couldn't do that. Yeah. But I played five games with a neck like this. <laughs> so, um, and I was like out of 15 starts. So um, fans will never see it. Fans will never know, but like that's kind of what like players know. But, Obviously, the team needed me, so I was like, I put my body on the line. But it just gave me that, and there were certain things that added to my, like just my routine every single every single day that I was there that um, that helped me when I was at Tranmere. So I carried on doing those little routines, um, like added in yoga, added in um, like other just stuff that allowed me just to really flourish on the pitch. And then going into Tranmere as um, one of the most experienced players in a young squad. I had that added responsibility within that within that team. Um, I knew the manager was kind of going to play me every week, so I knew I, it's just I needed I needed to perform, and um, it gave me that space to do that. Um, I guess just to hang on Falkirk for a moment, you might correct me, but was it just the one goal that you managed up there? Just the one goal, but unbelievable. Goal well, that's what I was going to say. Is <laughs> as far as if you're going to score one goal, you might as well make it a bicycle kick, which you did. Which was, I've seen it, and it it was brilliant. Yeah, so, yeah. At least, at least the one was a banger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but like, some some of the games, the main thing for me for me at the time was just performances, and I think um, some of my performances are actually really good up there. It's just like hit the crossbar, missed a couple of chances, like just getting that rustiness out of my system. So the performances was good. Um, of course, everyone wants the goals. The media wants the goals. I remember it was too funny. Actually. I remember missing a, like a on my right peg, missing a chance at Celtic, a home game, and Robbie Keane was playing for Celtic. So the back pages of the newspapers was like comparing me to Robbie Keane, and actually basically saying I'm crap, and Robbie Keane is like God. And like, uh, so it was just it was like interesting because I was like, okay, but he's on like probably fifty times the amount of money that I'm on as well. So it's like, you got to take those kind of things into consideration a little bit. Well, I guess you got whether or not he was playing, you would have got one over on the Ireland national team back in the day. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> nice. And yeah, like you said, maybe the goals didn't happen at Falkirk, but they certainly did at Tranmere. And then after Tranmere, you would move to um, Nottingham this time, so Notts County. Um, and there was actually mm-hmm. a, a guy on loan at Notts County when you were there. I believe an eighteen-year-old called Jack Grealish, who obviously these days. Um, is doing rather well for his um, club, Aston Villa, and of course for England too. So having played with a young Jack Grealish, are you surprised at how well he's doing now? Or was yeah, what was he like to play with at that young age? Were you already sold on the fact he was going to be a star? Yeah, that, like, not surprised at all. Um, he came in um, and he was just unbelievable. Like, he couldn't get the ball up him. We had senior pros like snapping him like literally in training because you couldn't get the ball of him and he was just like he would just get up and go again and dribble like the managers that had to make training sessions too tough so like he, he just couldn't embarrass some of the senior pros but like he no he was just he was absolutely unbelievable and he used to dribble he used to dribble a lot but um i guess at 18 he didn't really he obviously wasn't the finished article and obviously he didn't like it, it wasn't always the end product that he probably has now um but he he was just like Superb, done, done great for Notts County. Um, obviously helped them um, stay in the division at the time as well because they were just chopping and changing managers like anything. 
So um, yeah, so he, he 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 him and Callum McGregor, Callum McGregor from Celtic, they them two like um, really um, young boys come in and done really really well. Nice. Well, again, yeah, moving on from from Notts County, um, you had a, a few loan spells and then a couple of other moves a little further down the the English footballing pyramid. Um, but I wanted to focus a bit more on your your post playing career before we wrap things up. And um, mm-hmm. since you've retired from playing, which really wasn't that long ago, I think, what, maybe five years or so, you've you've still stayed connected to the game and um, you've served as an advisor for the New Jersey Teamsters Soccer Club and you own and run mm-hmm. Global Soccer Pathways through which you offer an elite level of personal coaching. But more than that, you also offer mentorship as somebody who's been there, done that and bought the T-shirt when it comes to having a professional soccer career. So essentially as a role model to these aspiring players who you coach, what do you think is your greatest strength or the one best piece of advice that you can offer to somebody who's trying to go pro? Um, well, I have, I have actually written an ebook called Unleash Your... I say soccer because I'm, I'm like in the American market. But it's like Unleash Your Soccer Potential because there's, there's a lot of kids that want to be pro. And I, I was there at 18, 17, 18 years old where it's like, I want to be pro, don't know how, I want to be pro, don't know how. And I think, um, so I created, the actual name of the company, Global Soccer Pathways, is literally um, because of that. I, I, I just wanted to have pathways when I was 18, right, into pro game, into elite training, into something where I can get to grips with my development. I had to learn it all by myself at that age. And I did certain things. I actually stopped drinking at 18, stopped kind of going out, trained more um, off my own back, um, just practice with a ball, with a ball, with a ball. Um, and when it got to the point where I, I had the opportunity to play against a professional team, I was in peak condition. Uh, I, w- I was fit. And the only reason why they actually asked me to come back on trial was because I was fit. I was an athlete. Um, afterwards, they were like, okay, he's got, he's got a little bit of ability as well. And so beginning of my career, I never exclusively played as a striker. I played centre mid a lot of times at Luton, right mid, left mid, even for Bristol as well. Only towards the end of my career that I played exclusively as a, as a number nine. But um, so just going off of that, there's, there's certain things that kind of I did that helped me become a pro. And this is kind of what I kind of teach to, to young players, aspiring players, which is one just like you've got to rise above your mistakes, your, neg- your, your self-doubts, um, your lack of self-belief. Because I, I went through all of that, even that in, in those eight months when I was on £40 a week. All of those things I was going through, I was like, when I, played, when I got dragged on my debut, I was like, damn, this game's not for me. The game's too quick. I'm not used to this pace of the game. And so it's like I had to go through all that, but still persevere and still go and still go forward. Then uh, the other side is just recognizing, recognizing kind of small victories. And again, just going off with my debut is like instead of feeling terrible that I got dragged, I was actually holding a minute. It's actually a huge victory for me because one, the manager had faith in me playing. I've only been in the professional arena three months in my whole life. And he started me in a game in a league against Plymouth Argyle away where they had almost 10,000 10, fans. And I was like, that's a huge victory for me. So I had to take the positive rather than keep focusing on the negative. So I always tell people to recognise small victories. And then the third is just kind of building on resilience and it's just like not giving up and finishing what you started and just doing the right things at the right time. When no one's watching you, are you doing the right things at the right time? And those are kind of like three elements where I really give... Um, that kind of advice to to young players where if you can master those three things, you have a chance. Like 99% of like, kids don't make it pro, but if you have to do the right things to get that opportunity. And I think those 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 three things are the, the main things I kind of coach on with young players. It's interesting to hear something we've heard from other footballers and ex-footballers about the discipline. And at the end of the day, there's so many talented players out there, but you mentioned being a great athlete as well is something that's going to potentially separate you. I guess on that note, as someone who took the long way around, but still still made a professional career for themselves, is there were there any players that you played with that had a much, much higher ceiling um, that never achieved it because of a lack of discipline? And would you say that looking back on your own career, you did make the most out of it or were, or do you think that there could have been moments where you could have even dug deeper maybe um so many players so many young boys come in on loan like i'll say ne- more naturally talented than myself they've been at pro clubs since they were eight years old like but they just didn't have that 
that drive, they couldn't overcome that, um, that those points where they didn't have that self-confidence or those points where the manager drops you and you're, you're not playing for a couple of weeks and they just, they just don't know how to handle it. And I know a big thing right now is about like kind of like mental health, but players are not taught how to handle their emotions and how to handle certain things that's happening to them. And when you come into, when you come from a place where you're the best every single week, to say you go into your, you're playing at your age level and you're the best every single week. And then you go into men's football and now you're not the strongest, you're not the quickest, you're not the sharpest. It's like, how do you handle that? I was lucky enough to play men's football at 17 years old. So even though some of the, even though the level I was playing at was like 11th tier in England, I wasn't the quickest, I wasn't the strongest and I wasn't the fastest. So that, at that level, I had to like challenge myself to say, how can I beat these guys using the skill set I have? And that changes your mentality. So I think playing your age group is, is great if you're playing pro, but you still need to keep going above your level, above your level to keep challenging yourself. So I think that enabled me to move into the pro game and say, okay, these guys may be bigger than me. How can I just navigate? How can I just use my, my IQ just to say, I'm going to use what I have and the skills that I have right now, it may not be the best. Like when I first started, I was terrible at heading the ball. Like literally, I, they became, I, made, I became a target man at the end of my career. I never had the ball um, playing youth football. Uh, I never needed to. I was bigger than most people. I just like pushed them out the way, take it down on my chest and, and play football. And then I, well, I played five-a-side football, a lot of five-a-sides. So I was always good at my feet, just trying to do things, practicing my feet because the game's called football, not head ball. So like, I was just always practicing with my feet. But those are the things that I just had to learn along the way. But some some players are not equipped to handle that element of the game where it's like you need to you need to go out and then improve, prove yourself, show that you can show that you can do it. And going off, I think I had other levels to go. I think obviously there was some things were a bit unlucky, some things I wish if I knew what I knew later on in my career, if I did it earlier, then probably I would have um I probably would have gone again with my career. I think there's um, towards the end of my career, I was like um, that time where I went on loan. I just got fed up with the kind of politics. I could have stayed playing. Um, either I had I had I had contracts um, offered to me by pro clubs, like in League Two, and I just didn't want to play because I wasn't enjoying it anymore. But I had that confidence in myself that I was, I can step out the game and and go into the business world and or go into the real to real life, and and handle that as well. And again, that's something that players need to realize because the transition is not easy it's not hard even for myself it's like you, you go from getting paid a certain amount to be like what well, this is how much you pay people <laughs> so it's that kind of level where it's like you need to understand that transition is difficult but you have to have your mind ready to adjust to certain situations and I think there's a there's a there's a big there's a big avenue that I think is needed for players aspiring players pro players um that that can help them with, with this aspect. And it's, it's basically just on how you deal with things. And once you're able to deal with things in an appropriate way to yourself, then um, it, there's not going to be as much issues with mental health or as much issues with the transition or going into gambling, alcoholism and all that kind of different stuff where they have that escapism. Yeah, I mean, um, you've obviously, you know, you've, you've mentioned about how, you know, hard work, discipline, practice, these are all the things that ultimately will you know put you on the pathway towards success um and it's interesting now you're in america obviously as someone in yourself who's got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree um i guess the pathway in america is you go into college soccer so you can continue your studies whilst pursuing um, a career in football um do you think now now that you're in the states would would you have potentially when you were making your way in those early years could you have seen yourself moving out to the States when you were younger to pursue a career? And also, would you advise um, young footballers in the UK who perhaps aren't in academies over in the United Kingdom to make that move over to the US um, to go through that collegiate system so they can get a chance in America, but also get a, um, a qualification too? Yeah, like I'm actually ambassador for a company that actually does that and they bring a lot of international kids over into America. Um, I education has been a huge part of my life. I think it gives you confidence off the field um, that actually translates on the field. Um, you can focus on different things. A lot of managers would be like, for example, um, at, when I was at Bristol, the manager used to be like, you have no passion for the game because he thought, because I was educated, like you can go work in a bank and be okay. And I'm like, I paid, I played football 
for 40 pound a week for eight months and you're telling me I have no passion like like seriously so um but like the whole education element I think um you can do it in conjunction with like your aspirations of going pro the American system is pretty cool in terms of that but it's not an ideal pro pathway in terms of they don't play enough football over the course of that semester but it's still an excellent experience in terms of players coming out. If you're not if you're not at a pro club young, you could potentially still get there. But you're um, if you're looking at coming out to the US, then that's an excellent experience and it's still the chance. So I've actually done something with Leeds United and Leeds Beckett University, which I'm an alumni, um, which is actually doing the US style system of a degree program plus the education that in England. So it's in conjunction with Leeds United. So we've just put that called the Carnegie International Soccer Academy. It's going to be based for international kids, not so much the U- UK based kids, but um, it's something that we've kind of worked with during this whole COVID period to put together. Um, it's, um, it gives them like nine months worth of football. They'd be done in the Leeds United um, kit. So for American kids and international kids, it's like they're going to walk around the campus like they're a pro almost. So, um, and they get to showcase games against professional academies as well. So that's something that is like again, it's, it's just another pathway for for aspiring players that just want to develop and, and get better at the game. Brilliant! No, it all sounds fantastic, and I mean, yeah, giving more opportunities to people is brilliant. Um, and I'm sure your story will inspire many people as well, and um, that you um, sort of mentor along the way, hopefully to professional football. But um, that actually brings us to the end of our interview today. So. Firstly, a big thank you to my co-host, Kai Tell, but then also a massive thanks to Enoch Shawunmi. Um, I hope you've enjoyed being our guest. Yeah, it's been fun. It's like, um, you know, strikers, we like to score the goal, so I just had to correct you guys a couple of times, but that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, we've um, we've we've not done you justice there, but you've um, <laughs> held us accountable, which is all good. But um, Enoch, how can our listeners um, follow you and kind of keep up to date with what you're doing? Um, Instagram, Facebook, Enoch Show on Me on Facebook at Enoch underscore Show on Me at on Instagram. Um, I'm probably one of the only Enoch Show Me's in the world, so you probably will be able to find me. Um, like pretty easy. Um, got a page on Facebook, Global Soccer Pathways, which is just going to have like little um, stuff about what I'm doing with Leeds United in terms of that that program, other elite pathways, um, just general information as you're going to see there about um, just like overcoming adversity and building on confidence, building resilience, just like um, information and value for players that want to, again, take the game to the next level. Um, Anyone could email me at info at globalsoccerpathways.com and that goes straight to me. So um, if they had any questions, any advice, I'm happy to give to give free advice um, to anyone that's that's willing to reach out. Like I said, it's like when I was 18, I wanted to go pro, never had no pros to give me that kind of guidance. So I'm here to for people to utilize my knowledge and expertise as well. Fantastic. Well, I hope that our listeners do. That sounds like a great opportunity that you don't normally get. But um, if you want to follow us as well, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can follow us at United Mates FP. And then if you want to watch our videos on YouTube, just type in United Mates Football Podcast and subscribe there. That's all for now. Thank you very much and goodbye.